Pakistan's economy is in serious crisis. The nation is almost at the verge of bankruptcy. Well, in past, because of the bitter relationship between the two countries, it may have been news for revelry. However, prudence demands to understand that when the neighbor's house is on fire, well, better to put a bucket of water because otherwise the fire could even engulf your house. So this situation of Pakistan's economic crisis is something that India has to watch with great caution. Hello, my friends. My name is Kagan Singh, a recruitment specialist and a leadership coach. And I welcome you all to this video where we'll talk about Pakistan's crisis. And we'll try to cover five topics over here. Number one, what is the situation in Pakistan today? Number two, why is it that it has come to such a pass that the situation is so bad? Number three, what are the possible actions which Pakistan government could do? Number four, what are the implications for India? And number five, on a holistic basis, what are the important learnings from the Pakistan situation? But first, let us start with topic number one, what is happening in Pakistan? To understand the situation in Pakistan, please imagine that your salary were to be reduced to half of what it is right now because the GDP per capita is roughly half of it. So let's say if you're earning 50,000 rupees, your income is reduced to 25,000. Thereafter, whatever you are buying is roughly three times more expensive. So if you have been having an income in hand of about 50,000 rupees, the income is reduced to half. And if your monthly expenses were, let's say 20,000, the expenses for the same lifestyle are now 60. This means that your lifestyle has gone down by approximately one sixth. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, the basic problem in Pakistan is that the income levels are radically lower when compared with India, but expenses in recent times have gone up by almost three times. Petrol and diesel are hovering closer to 300 rupees. Food products like onion, wheat, flour, these products are hovering somewhere around 200 rupees benchmark. And all of this has happened because inflation in general is touching around 30% mark and food inflation specifically is now touching the threshold of 40%. To compare this with India, you can imagine that when Indian inflation, the CPI was crossing 6%, all alarm bells were ringing. And in Pakistan right now, we are talking about inflation, which is closer to 30% plus. And food inflation is closer to 40% plus. Therefore, once that happens, the lifestyle is really in trouble. And there are four important factors which have led to this, and they can be called as dips. These debt situation, Pakistan has such terribly poor reserves right now that it doesn't have enough money to pay back debt. It doesn't have enough funds to pay its interest obligations. The country's debt to GDP ratio is approximately 70%. Its income is so pathetically low that the external debt borrowings, the interest that it has to pay, it won't be able to do that and therefore may become a defaulter. The second big problem is I, which is inflation. As I just explained, the price of commodities have gone up so tremendously high that inflation has made life for the common man really terrible. The P specifically is about power, which reflects to all kind of infrastructure. There are electricity outages. Malls are set to be closed at 8.30. Wedding halls get closed at 10. And despite all of that, the power supply is in pathetic position. And then finally, S is about supply of essential items, pharmaceutical medicines, input materials for production, Input materials for lifestyle services, everything has been hit because there is not enough foreign exchange currency to import goods which are needed. The import bill is far higher than the export earnings and therefore this lack of parity has led to a situation where in the free market, Pakistan rupee is now trading at about 260 rupees to a US dollar, which is three times worse compared to Indian level of about 80, 82 rupees. Therefore, all in all, these four reasons, which can be called as dips, have led to Pakistan's present situation of great turmoil. Next, let us move on to understand that how come it happened that a country which had gained independence at the same time as India, a country which was one of the fast growing economies of 60s, 70s, is now in such a terrible situation. How did Pakistan depart from the path of growth? And the answer lies in the term depart, where D talks about drying up of AIDS. Now, the meaning of drying up of AIDS need to be understood with some historical context. The historical context here is that when Pakistan gained independence from 1947 till 1970 for about 23 years, there was no government over there. And during this period, well, unfortunately, the army domination led to a situation that Pakistan was essentially becoming a heaven for United States to use Pakistan as a battleground or as a breeding ground for forces which were to fight the Russian various offensive invasions, specifically in Afghanistan. So USA became the big donor 
And why USA did that was because the problem was that when India and Pakistan split, India had essentially taken a pro-Russian stance. Now, that meant that to have a balance of power in Asia, Pakistan needed an ally and US needed that ally and Pakistan became that ally for them. Now in doing so, what US was doing as their own strategic advantage was that to contain Russian invasion of Afghanistan, US was not required to send its army anymore. Just imagine if US would have been sending its own army, it would have had to pay them salary, it would have had to give accountability explanation to its citizens. But now, grooming so-called mercenaries in Pakistan soil meant that all Pakistan had to do was to pay a bill. And once that bill was paid, the job was done because Pakistan trained mercenaries were fighting the Afghan war against Russia. Now, all this went very well till about 1989, when the war ended, Russia withdrew. And at this time, suddenly, US doning, uh, the various donations that the US was giving the aid also stopped. And that hit Pakistan very badly. However, the situation turned once again around the 9-11 attack when uh, Taliban attacked the Twin Towers. And the US realized that it once again needed Pakistan, this time to contain Taliban. And an act was passed because of which about equivalent of 12,000 crore rupees started coming as aid once again to Pakistan. So this continued up until say about 2010 when uh, slowly it was realized that the kind of support which Pakistan was providing was very dubious because a lot of the terrorists were eventually found to have had their actual living inside Pakistan only. So that's when the aid became questionable and later on in Donald Trump era, aid was completely stopped. And once that stopped, Pakistan was its shambles. However, in came the donor number two, which was China. But the problem with China was that China wasn't just giving aid, it was essentially loans. And as we all know, China typically follows something which is called the debt trap strategy. Now, the Chinese debt trap strategy is simple, that they would give loan at high interest rate, and then they would demand that Chinese companies, Chinese workers should be given an opportunity to complete the project. So China entered into China-Pakistan economic corridor, where China wanted to get strategic access to the port town, Gwadar port in Pakistan, and therefore extended it as a part of its Belt and Road Initiative. But things went nice for a while, and Pakistan was pumped in almost $30 billion by China. However, once the Pakistan government was assumed by Imran Khan, he took a more anti-China stand. Slowly, China's grand design of using Pakistan just as a pawn to gain strategic importance was known. And there was the period when Pakistan started showing its resistance. China kept on ploughing in money, but sooner rather than later, they realized that the money is unlikely to come back because it was getting squandered in some sense. So much so that the interest payments were getting delayed and the debt, including interest, which up until about five years back was about $47 billion, is today stated to be about $64 billion with very little chance of its recovery. So therefore, that's when China also withdrew. Now, when China went back, another problem which happened was China shut down the power plants which it had made. So it had developed about 20 plus power plants which were contributing about 5,000 megawatt and that was stopped, which is leading now to the power outage. So USA gone, China gone, Saudi Arabia in a state of turmoil, essentially the fund sources dried up. And this drying of aid led to a situation where Pakistan was not in a position to maintain its current account balance, its foreign exchange balance. And that became the first big reason why Pakistan is in trouble today. The E is about economic policies. Now, fortunately or unfortunately, because of the strong army domination, Pakistan's economic growth was really thwarted. While countries such as Bangladesh, also India, of course, became a legendary force, were investing on infrastructure, developing the manufacturing sector, developing the agriculture sector, focusing on services. Pakistan was somehow, fortunately or unfortunately, having its own problems related to terrorism, rogue nation, domestic complications in terms of instability. And because of all of that, the development of nation in terms of a strong foundation of infrastructure never happened. And these weak economic policies led to a situation where today, Pakistan is neither strong in services, not in manufacturing, and of course, not that strong anymore in agriculture. This was a very big reason of its weak situation right now. The P is about politics. Extremely unfortunately, in the period from 1970, when it's got its first elected government, so-called quote-unquote elected government, till today, in a period of more than 50 years, they have had 29 different prime ministers, and not even one PM has completed the five-year tenure. And if we divide 53 by 29, well, the rough number is about 
1.8 years or so. So no government got an opportunity to complete its tenure. There were various dubious situations where there were assassinations and the legendary leaders who were heading the country were either assassinated or simply disappeared overnight. And because of that, the political regime was so unstable that any kind of policies which would have helped to the larger welfare were compromised. And the fourth, but probably the biggest reason of Pakistan's decay has been army. Now you may say, why is army a reason of decay? And the answer lies, army does a great job when it is there to defend. However, in Pakistan, army controls a huge portion of almost every possible industry. From textile, to bread, to cement, to real estate. Please imagine army doing all of it. And unfortunately, there are serious allegations that there is heavy level of corruption in the army. The previous general, the head of entire armed staffs, General Baveja, has alleged to have a net worth of about 1270 crore rupees, which of course by no fair standards can be justified by his legitimate known sources of income. So army has such a strong stranglehold on the economy and with huge level of corruption being alleged, the money is getting siphoned off. So instead of the various aids reaching the people being used for infrastructure development of the nation, the same aid has been used very unfortunately to fill the coffers of army. And because of the inefficiency in production, the monopoly in real estate and various other things, the efficiency of doing this production was also compromised. And this has been a very tragic reality of Pakistan. Not to mention the fifth R, which is about a rogue nation. The worst thing which happened was that army used its disproportionately huge allocation of defense budget, partially for fighting various causes, but more for creating Pakistan as a terrorist grooming center. A lot of terrorist camps were used where terrorists were trained to be sent to fight the Afghan war, various other wars, and of course, the controversy with India and Kashmir. And this can be beautifully demonstrated by the tragic situation where 1989 was when the Afghan war stopped and around the same time, Kashmir insurgency increased. And the reason is, of course, not far-fetched that the mercenaries which were fighting the Afghan war, they were then relocated to Kashmir. So Pakistan essentially became a rogue nation. It came in the FACTA gray list. And once that happened, then obviously its interest rates became higher because its credit rating became lower and its credibility as a nation was questioned. And of course, the last T of the part is terrorism. Pakistan became a center of terrorism. And of course, if you were try to create this kind of a malice, it will come back to haunt you. It happened with Pakistan because the terrorist groups started creating ruckus inside Pakistan. So much so that tourism, which used to constitute a significant portion of earning, absolutely died. Look at the instances of cricket teams, various other sport teams trying to shy off from going into Pakistan. So this is the entire framework of Depart which led to the decay of Pakistan. Now, when all of this has happened, where are we today? We are at a situation where the only hope for Pakistan is an IMF bailout. And what is IMF bailout? Well, it is definitely a bitter pill, more of an extremely excruciating, painful injection. Why is it painful? Well, for this, let's go back briefly to what happened in India in 1991. India had to resort to IMF bailout in 1991 when we had a balance of payment crisis. And IMF generally dictates terms which are stated to be towards larger efficiency, but most of them are non-populist because they are typically about increasing taxation, opening up of economies. All of such moves are likely to be deleterious to the common citizen in terms of their instant gratification. Their incomes could fall, their expenses could increase further. However, IMF looks about broader structure sustainability. They do all of this to ensure that the debt which they are going to offer should be payable. So in case of Pakistan, there is a situation that IMF debt, IMF bailout is not new to them. It is stated that they have gone to IMF about 23 times. And even the present IMF bailout package was discussed in 2019 when they were offered $6 billion. And thereafter, a top-up line of $1 billion was offered, so total $7 billion. However, after Imran Khan started taking more populist measures, this bailout package was frozen. And it was said that Pakistan government has to mend its act. So thereafter, the regime, take, uh, the regime change took place and in the new government, they did certain amount of malleable attitude towards accepting IMF's terms and conditions. So where we are today, long negotiations have been going on and almost like a beggar, like Imran Khan said in the precise word, like a beggar, Pakistan government has been beseeching IMF to release this bailout package and IMF has been insisting on few important conditions. The first condition is to reduce the funding being given to army and this could be complicated because really it's army which controls Pakistan as a country. It's often said that Pakistan army never won a war, but it never lost a PM election. Every time 
the PM selected was someone whom army had been supporting. So this first bitter pill is something which is quite unpalatable because army budget is something which if army itself is controlling, they may not be happy to accept. The second tough condition is to increase the taxation rate. Now imagine going to the example which I said in the beginning that income of people is half, expenses are triple. In such a situation, you start taxing the people. Well, there's going to be greater unrest. And the third and the toughest one is remove the subsidies or ensure that the subsidies reach to the poorest of the poor. This means that the middle class or the lower middle class may from now on be bereft of subsidies and therefore you can expect more protest. And all of this means that the position of the prime minister is really very challenging because you have to argue and fight against the powerful force which has put you in place. So if army has helped you get your seat, how do you tell the army to reduce its expenses? How do you go to the people and tell them that pay taxes when they are already devoid of a decent lifestyle? How do you remove their subsidies when they don't even have the basic amenities of life? So all of this makes IMF bailout package quite tough. But still, when compared to other alternatives, US has withdrawn the support. China is now in a very controversial situation and therefore Chinese debt is something which Pakistan is realizing could be a more dangerous debt trap. So therefore, IMF bailout looks like to be the only option. Now in such a situation, we move to the fourth point, the Indian viewpoint. And I come back to my original quote that when your neighbor's house is on fire, well, you had better start making the effort to put water on it because you never know when that engulfs your house. Now, what is at stake for India over here? Usually a weaker Pakistan would be a beneficial thing because then at least their army cannot do the notorious act of sponsoring terrorism in India. Well, it's a mixed bag over here. The reason it's a mixed bag is because if Pakistan government becomes bankrupt, who does the control resort to? The control eventually goes back to army. And even within the army, if there are certain extraterritorial rogue elements which assume charge, then the big danger is the nuclear risk. Pakistan has nuclear arsenal and if the nuclear red button is in wrong hands, well, the regional stability could be destroyed. So what is it that India could do? Of course, India helped Sri Lanka bail out. India has been helping other neighboring countries. So in case of Pakistan, well, while it may not be so easy for India to take a direct proactive measure, however, India has to very carefully and in a great alert manner watch the happenings in Pakistan and in a general sense, take a supportive role towards helping the democratic, so-called democratic government, maintain a situation that the house doesn't completely fall like a pack of cards, which is now being apprehended that will happen. Because at the end of the day, a rogue regime could really then have no other option but to start selling its nukes to other rogue countries, because that is of course the easiest way to earn income. And in Pakistan's case, there have been past instances when such a thing was done. So India needs to be very alert, very watchful. And the least we could do is, not create any trouble for Pakistan it's in its uh, process towards a recovery and maybe also offer a supporting hand in terms of export import trade while of course doing that with a caution that how are we watching that the army situation is being balanced towards the government. Now, finally, let me conclude this video by giving you management lessons, a very popular GD topic that what are the management learnings from the Pakistan crisis. And for this, I like to give you an acronym called five great learnings. Now, what are the five great learnings from a corporate, from a leadership and from any kind of business management context? The first G is governance. No matter how great a business model do you have, if those who are controlling the business model have issues of ethics and a huge amount of money is being leaked out because of corruption, then be it a company, be it you as a household or as a country, you can never be financially stable. So governance has to be in the right hands. If there are corrupt politicians, if there is a corrupt army which is ruling, if there is a corrupt regime, no matter what happens, the nation can never prosper. The success of various Western nations, United States, Canada, Australia, so many other nations, Japan, has come at a situation where at least in the political life, the corruption levels may not have been zero, but have been at minimal level. Compare that to developing nations, the African nations, many Asian economies, corruption has been draining these countries. So governance becomes of paramount importance. The second R, is about revenue generation. For a nation, for an organization, for an individual to thrive, one should not rely on a set stream of revenue. Pakistan's excessive reliance on aid from first USA, then China, Saudi Arabia, failed to create the enough motive and incentive to build up manufacturing capabilities, servicing capabilities. And this reliance on something which was like an apple in the lap because of its geopolitical location, eventually proved to be its Achilles heel. Because once, US did not need Pakistan for geopolitical reasons. China realized that it is controversial to give more debt to Pakistan. Suddenly the age dried. Therefore, if you're an organization which is excessively relying on any wine kind of a business model, if you're an individual 
who's relying on only one kind of a skill set in an organization, you need to diversify, add on new skills, add up knowledge portfolio so that you don't only rely on one specific revenue stream, one specific functional area, you diversify. The third E is about expenses. It's needless to say that no country can prosper if its expenses are more than its revenue. No household can prosper if expenses are more than revenue. Therefore, always watch your pocket and spend according to the expenses. In the context of a country, it means subsidies have to be controlled and more importantly, subsidies have to be diverted specifically to those who are really the needy ones. And therefore, expense control is a vital learning. The A over here is about alliances. You can't afford to have fights which you are just fragmenting or creating from your own figment of imagination. Pakistan's greatest folly lied in the fact that post-partition, instead of making a healthy alliance with India, it was always having a belligerent attitude. And that led to the growing and fostering of army. So the funds, approximately 15% of its entire budget, which was being spent on army, could have been spent on constructive ends. So make alliances with neighbors, make alliances with like-minded people, because that will ensure that your wasteful expense on defense can be avoided and can be used for constructive things. And finally, T is about continuously transform yourself. As a nation, if you look at the success of India, we were essentially an agriculture dominated economy. But then came the manufacturing revolution, which helped us become from a poor nation to a rising nation. But then came the software revolution, which helped India catapult to the great power which we are and is now guiding us on the path to success. Unfortunately, in the case of Pakistan, no such transformation happened. So in our lives, in our organizations, in our households, we must follow the great principle to ensure that we don't follow and depart from the path of success like Pakistan did. So this is Gagan Singh and we conclude our video on Pakistan. If you have liked the video, please press the like button, subscribe button and stay tuned for more videos to help you ace your group discussions, interviews and hone your leadership skills.